Hello, my name is David Dowling and I am grateful for the opportunity today to present as part of the J. Reuben Clark Law Society's virtual programs. A uh, little bit of background on me, I am a full-time family and divorce mediator in Southern California. I'm actually originally from Dublin, Ireland, so you might hear a little bit of an accent and I apologize, it's a, a little confusing sometimes. Um, I've been in the US for just slightly over 20 years. Uh, I'm married and have four children. And prior to mediating full-time, I was a law school professor, uh, director of a mediation clinic in law school and mediated a vast array of different kinds of cases. And currently I still teach part-time for the Strauss Institute at Pepperdine's School of Law. So my background is in mediation, negotiation, and dispute resolution. And so that's what I'm gonna be talking uh, about today and touching on as part of this presentation. Uh, I'm going to share a PowerPoint that kind of will walk through a lot of the things I'm talking about. And one of the things that I wanna to stress to you is, and I put my email address at the beginning and at the end of the presentation. So please, if you have any questions, if you want any additional information, I have a ton of, um, handouts, uh, materials that I use in my classes when I'm teaching. Uh, so if you want anything, just please email me. I'm happy to share that with you. Um, you know, I teach this uh, PowerPoint. I teach portions of it um, to law students. I teach it to judges. I've taught it to practitioners. And so it's just material that I've, you know, um, used over the years. And so I hope that you'll find it useful. I hope that you'll find something that will work for you and that you'll be able to incorporate into what you do. I know many of us, as we practice, we feel strong in our skill set, but I feel that we can always learn something new. So I'm just going to jump in and pull up my PowerPoint. And so I can share that. That's right there. All right. So let's pop this up like this. So as I said, today what we're talking about is key skills uh, and practices for effect effective negotiators. And you know, remember and understand that all of us can improve our skills and all of us can learn something new. So this is me, David Dowling with the California Family Mediation Center here in uh, Southern California. I'm a co-owner and mediator. And then as I said, I teach part-time for the Strauss Institute at Pepperdine's University School of Law. Um, and that's my email address, so, and I'll share it again at the end if you want to reach out and, and ask me for any of the articles that I have. So negotiation is something that everybody does almost every day. So let's think about this, right? Um, we have internal negotiations, right? Uh, do I wear this tie? Do I wear that tie? Um, do I choose to do these things or not? Uh, they're constantly, we're constantly negotiating within ourselves. And then traditionally what we think about is negotiation with others. Uh, if you have children, you negotiate with your children. If you have a spouse, a partner in life, if you have a partner in business, you negotiate with them, right? So we're constantly negotiating things like where are we going to go grab lunch? What are we going to do today? How should we proceed with X, Y, and Z? when to do certain things. So negotiation is part of life. And so for many of us, we develop certain traits and attributes that then as we grow into our professions, sometimes can be very helpful and very beneficial. And then there are some things that we've learned and developed over the years that maybe hinder us when it comes to negotiation. So even though we might be in the practice of law, um, there are still things that we want to learn or change about ourselves that we've developed in how we negotiate from our childhood, patterns that we've learned from our parents, things that we've picked up along the way. So we're going to touch on some of this today. So negotiations occur for several different reasons, and I've kind of touched on some of them already. So let's take a quick look at this. So to agree on how to share or divide a limited resource. So this is what we typically think of, right? So the money, how are we gonna divide the money? The orange, how are we gonna split the orange, right? So limited resources that need to be divided. And so uh, cutting the sandwich in half versus dividing up um, a business, uh, resources, time, energy, whatever it might be. There are a lot of different negotiations when you're, you know, even working in the yard, what, where are you going to do? What work are you going to work on? What's somebody else going to work on? So one of the foremost reasons that we negotiate in life is on how to sh share or divide uh, limited resources to create something new that neither party could attain on his or her own. So this is 
a really beautiful part of negotiation, right? When people come together, when companies come together to form something that will benefit them, right? And this happens in life too with relationships, right? When people come together to get married, um, we do premarital mediation. And what that involves is this party sitting down to kind of plan out and think about what they want from life, what they want to get out of life. So where they want to live, how many kids they might want to have. And the same can be said for companies working together. So maybe I have uh, a certain skill set or a certain resource and you uh, have something that complements that or a manufacturing plant that can develop uh, and assist me in the distribution of whatever I've got. So we're going to come together and sit down and negotiate. And that usually comes in be it the relationship phase or the business phase, what I like to call the, the dating phase of the negotiation, when we're in a happy phase, right? So creating something new and working together is when people are in that happy phase, when they're uh, proactive, they're productive, they wanna work together, they see the benefit in everything that they're doing together. And so those negotiations, although they can be very tough, they can be, uh, you know, uh, sometimes adversarial, the end result is going to always be something good and relationships matter in those kinds of negotiations. And I'm going to talk about how relationships make a difference to negotiations as we move on. So then what we also have is to solve a problem or a dispute between parties, which is something that I deal with a lot in uh, mediation as somebody who facilitates a negotiation. So that's what a mediator is. We just facilitate negotiation. So think about this, right? We've got um, people who are in dispute. And so there are multiple levels, uh, steps that I call them to resolving a dispute when you get involved. So I always say to my students, the, the first option is always you can do nothing, right? Which never seems to be an option for a lot of people. But if you're frustrated with something, if you're upset with something, you can just leave it alone and do nothing, right? So acquiesce, do nothing, just leave it there. The second option or second stage is self-help, right? So that's where you just decide to rectify the problem, uh, talk to the other person, try to fix the dispute, whatever it might be, proactively going out and seeking to resolve the, the issue, the dispute, the problem. The third step would be negotiation. And in the more traditional sense of sitting down with the other side to negotiate. Now, the great thing here with negotiation is that you can bring in a, a support, an advocate, an attorney, a lawyer, a solicitor, a barrister, whatever it might be, not a barrister, but bring in somebody that works with you in the legal community to sit with you to help you through that negotiation process, right? So in that stage, in the negotiation stage, it's much more uh, formal. It's the idea of sitting down face to face at a table to work things through. So then the next step would be, um, sorry, I keep adjusting my glasses. The next step would be uh, mediation, which is what I do. And that's where you then bring in a third party. So in mediation, you bring in a third party neutral, somebody like me that can sit down and help facilitate that negotiation, help the parties navigate uh, whatever they're dealing with, if, it's, if they're on the path to litigation, whatever it might be. The next step would be then arbitration, which would be part of maybe a contractual uh, if, uh, agreement that if a dispute arises, we're going to arbitrate. You bring in an arbitrator or a panel of arbitrators. And those are things that you agree to when you're in that dating phase, right? So part of the early negotiations when you're negotiating around um, working together is what steps you'll take when you reach a dispute. If there's a breakdown in communication, if there's a breakdown in ideology, how will you handle that dispute? And so you'll see a lot of contracts, negotiation contracts set out how we will resolve because the last step um, in resolving a dispute that often is a step that people don't want to go to. And especially in those contract negotiations, they try to avoid it through use of mediation and arbitration is litigation. And that's bringing a judge or somebody who can adjudicate um, the result or the outcome of the dispute. So there are multiple levels, multiple steps that each provide an opportunity to negotiate. And remember, even when you get into that litigation phase, negotiation is still a key and important part of it. So these skills and attributes really uh, work through that entire process. So when we think about negotiation, we have to think about two key elements, which is claiming value and uh, value, or value claiming and value creation. So the opportunities to win or share those resources. So claiming value is the result of zero sum or distributive situations where the object is to gain the largest piece of the resource. So again, if you think of that orange, right? So an orange might have 
eight sections, so we can literally split it down the middle, but sometimes an orange has 15, right? Uh, sorry, an odd number. So I said eight, I meant to say 16, and we can split it eight and eight, or sometimes it has 15 and we are thinking seven and eight. Sometimes I might be hungrier than you, or I might see that my need is greater than yours, so I want a bigger piece of that orange, so I'm gonna demand more. And so that's claiming the value, right? So that's that distributive, and we're gonna talk about this in more detail. There's a, a limited resource, a fixed resource, and we're gonna divide it or split it. Creating value is the result of the non-zero sum or integrative negotiation where the object uh, is to have both parties do well, and both parties feel like they're walking away from the negotiation uh, in a win-win. Now, I wanna clarify because sometimes when I teach this to, especially to attorneys, this concept of win-win is a little bit lost on them. How can we both feel like we've won? What you have to remember is that your idea of what a win might be and my idea of what a win might be might be very different. So it's not necessarily that we're coming out like this. Parties have very different perspectives and I've seen this time and time and time again as a mediator where somebody's come in and felt like they got a great deal, the other person actually thinks that they won, and both people walk away with the sense that they actually accomplished what they wanted through the mediation or negotiation process, okay? So we've got value claiming every negotiation, I just wanna be clear, every negotiation has value claiming. Every negotiation with the win, we've got a resource that we're gonna divide, or distribute, whatever it might be, whether it's roles, attributes, uh, you know, money, whatever it might be, property. Value creation uh, can be a part of negotiation and we'll look at how that can play into negotiation. So most actual negotiations are a combination of claiming and creating value. Um, and so what you see is that negotiators must be able to recognize situations that require more of one approach than the other. So this is key, is thinking and understanding about what kind of situation am I going into, what negotiation am I going into, and do I want to think about this as a value claiming, uh, I want the resources, or a value creation, is there an opportunity for me to create value, add value to the negotiation, and then we can split up the resources at the table. And you, you must be able to understand the two distinct approaches, right? Because one is driven by relationships and the other one is not, okay? So negotiators must be versatile in their comfort and use of the major strategic approaches. So when I teach dispute resolution techniques, what I say to my students, and some of you have heard this, and I apologize for using a phrase that maybe gets overused. I talk about toolbox approach to uh, negotiation. So if I was to come along and you said that you needed your television fixed, and you call me and said, David, can you come in and fix my television? And I turn up at your door and I've, I've got a hammer in my hand, right? So I turn up and I've got this hammer and I say, hey, I'm, I'm here to fix your TV. Well, your television is very sensitive, right? These days they're, you know, very thin sheets of technology that hang on our wall. And so me turning up with a hammer, you're gonna be like, there's, there's no way that you can come in and fix my TV. You have one tool, it's not a tool that's appropriate. You're not pulling nails out of the back of the TV. Uh, you're gonna need a lot of different tools. So if I turn up your house to fix your television and I have a toolbox, what that tells you is that I have an array of tools that I can handle any situation or any problem that I confront when I get in there. So cutting wires, stripping wires, whatever it might be. I don't know electrics and I don't know TVs and electronics very well, but you know that when I turn up, I'm gonna have like screwdrivers to you know open up the back, to take a look and everything else. So it's the same approach goes for negotiation. So for me to come in and sit down, and uh, have just one approach. This is what I'm gonna do. I've got my hammer, I'm gonna negotiate like this. This is the only way I can negotiate. It's not gonna be very productive to every single negotiation because you're gonna come in with a different mindset. The negotiation is going to be about something very different than the one that I did yesterday. So I can't always come in with the one approach. So what I need to do is, as a skilled practitioner, is expand on my skills, add to those skills, and uh, develop an approach that enables me that when I get into the room or I think about what I'm negotiating around, then I'm able to develop uh, the or use the tools that, that will be more effective in that specific negotiation. So negotiator perceptions of situations tend to be biased towards seeing problems as more distributive or competitive than they really are. So when I teach full-time, when I'm in the classroom, I do this um, kind of little game with my students 
if any of you teach, you can use this. And what I do is I have the students turn and face each other. So I line them up and doesn't matter, male, male, female, female, male and female. I line them all up facing each other. So they're sitting across the table from each other. And then what I do is I say to them, okay, what I want you to do is take your, your right elbow and put it on the table. So they put the right elbow on the table. And then I want you to hold the hand of the person sitting across from you. So they hold hands. So now they're assuming this position and automatically in their heads, their muscle memory tells them they're going to arm wrestle. So then I read the instructions and the instructions tell them that the way to gain points is to have the back of their partner's hand touch the table, right? So the back of the partner's hand, so either this way or that way, touch the table. And the more points they get, the better, right? So automatically then people will sit down, they'll kind of assume the position and then they'll lock in and you'll see them like holding on tight because what they feel they're doing is they're competing against this person and they're not listening. And we're going to talk about listening. They haven't listened to the instructions because my instruction said the back of your partner. So partner denotes we're going to work together, right? But when we put people into certain negotiation positions, what they automatically want to do is compete. I like I've come in here. I've got to win. I've got to get it all. I've got to take it all. And so what you'll have is some students will understand the game they'll go back and forth and they'll end up with 20 points. And then you'll have a team sitting there and they're locked and maybe one person will have given up a point or maybe none. And so we'll go around the room and I'll say, so you guys have one, you guys have two, you have 20. So you can each now get 10 points a piece. So what, by working together, by listening and understanding and recognizing the opportunity to work together and create value, they've actually created more points for the game and more points to be distributed. Whereas those who go in and just want to claim value, they've limited the number of points that can be shared between the group. So just something to think about. Okay, so approach to the subject. So we're going to think, most people think about bargaining and negotiation. They mean the same thing. However, we're going to be a little bit more distinctive in how we address these two. So bargaining describes that competitive win-lose situation, right? So that distributive or competitive win-lose uh, approach. So negotiation, we're gonna to refer to, it means that win-win situation. And again, I want you to get rid of this idea that like win-win, we're all in it together, it's all gonna be good, we all walk out feeling like we came out on the same level. That's not necessarily what we're talking about here, right? What we're talking about is recognizing, and we're gonna talk about needs and interests and goals, right? And addressing those, and those might, might not mean giving up anything at all, right? So, so these win-win situations that occur when parties try to find a mutually acceptable solution to a complex conflict, okay? So when we think about the distributive, it's much more positional, right? So we've got positions, the wants, that tangible, that something that you've decided that you want, that it's an expressed, like, this is what I need, okay? So versus uh, interests, which is what, why, why, what's going on here? Why do you need this? What else is happening? What are the drivers in this? Like, what's the reason behind um, your approach to this negotiation? So you've, you've stated your position. So what I'm going to do is move away from positions and try to understand your interests. So let's touch on distributive bargaining first. So most negotiators, um, most, most negotiations are a mixed mode of exchange. So a tension between a desire to compete and cooperate, right? Because we do tend to go in there, even though we, we have this competitive streak in us, we kind of go in there thinking I should you know, co cooperate, but there's trust. Trust is a big issue in, in a negotiation, right? So positional or competitive bargaining is a, uh, I win as much as I can style of approach, right? So this, this distributive or positional competitive bargaining is I want to get as much as I can. I want to win, win, win. Okay. So it's called distributive bargaining because you distribute the substance uh, between the parties, right? So that's what all we're there to do is divide up the pie or the orange. You're not creating value. You're taking the value from the other person. Okay. So distributive bargaining is predictable. So this is something that you have to understand. There's a pattern to this. So you can use that predictability to enhance the likelihood of a deal. Now, one thing I want to stress to you is, you know, I'm talking about Oh, let's work together. Let's use, you know, integrative or, you know, cooperative bar, uh, negotiation as a way, distributive bargaining. Oh, 
they both have their place in negotiation, right? So learning, as I said, the different tools, putting more tools in your toolbox. I'm not saying one approach is good, one approach is bad. They're both actually really useful, but in order to use both of them effectively, you have to understand them. So with distributive bargaining, it, there's a predictability to it, right? There's a there's something that you know you can understand. So let's take a look at this, right? So uh, we're gonna talk about the, the dance that occurs. So this is a back and forth movement of positions or concessions that produces an agreement or impasse, right? So the parties start here, and then what they start doing is they start working toward that ground, middle ground. Now, the middle ground might be more this way, right? Or it might be more this way, but they start this dance, right? Um, and there are steps involved there, right? So it's predictable, uh, a predictable relationship between the size of the concession and the time, okay? So let's take a look at this. Each concession tends to be about half the size of the concession that preceded it and takes about twice as long to be made, right? When we hear an offer, when something, a concession is made, when an offer is put on the table, we're gonna take time, we're gonna think about it, we have to strategize, think about our next move, what we're going to do that follows up, right? So every offer is a message. So every offer that's made is conveying something to you and you need to understand that and be able to read that and think about what's going in there, right? And reciprocity is expected. And so reciprocity means if I give a little, I'm expecting you to give a little, right? So remember this because a lot of times what will happen is, is if I'm a very skilled negotiator and especially good at... Um, this kind of distributive bargaining approach, what'll happen is you'll sit down, you'll make an offer, and I'll sit there, I'll dig my heels in, I'll use some tactics uh, to stonewall, and I'll get you to make a second offer. So you're essentially bidding against yourself, right? But we do expect reciprocity. If I give a little, you need to give a little. So it may not be possible or advisable to try to short circuit the dance. Now, I see this with students all the time, right? Students will come in, they'll sit down, they'll do a simulation role play negotiation. Somebody will say, this is what I want. And it falls within the zone of potential agreement for students. So what they want to do is kind of see an opportunity to just resolve, settle and go, yay, we did a good thing, right? But short circuiting the dance might be detrimental to you, to your client, right? So it's not always good to believe that you can just go straight to the end. There are certain steps that have to be taken. You can't just get up there and take the trophy and be the winner of the dance competition. For lack of a better analogy. All right, so um, what makes integrative bargaining uh, or integrative negotiation different? So let's take a look at this, okay? So, um, so focus on commonalities rather than differences. So what we're doing is we're looking at what the parties have in common rather than focusing on the differences between the parties. So we're trying to figure out what everybody has in common, okay? So we address the needs and interests, not positions, and we're gonna look at this more specifically. So we're, we're trying to figure out what are the needs, what are the interests, what are the things driving this negotiation instead of what are the positions that they've placed, for, put out there, put forward. So commit to a meeting, uh, meeting the needs of all involved, right? So all the parties. That means asking good questions, listening, and trying to understand exactly what they're interested in um, so that you can better address those needs and think of solutions on how you can help them feel like they, they uh, achieved a, a positive outcome for themselves. So exchange of information and ideas. Now, exchanging information is very difficult because it does require trust, right? And one of the things that you'll find is when you go out and you're negotiating, when you get out there and you're doing things, um, you develop a reputation. So if you are only a distributive bargainer, if you're only going in there in negotiations and taking, 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 you, that reputation is preceding you and people don't want to work with you. People don't want to negotiate with you. So think about how you want to be perceived. Do you want to be perceived as somebody who in certain situations you're willing to work with others, uh, work with others, and then in some situations where it requires it, you're drawing a firm line and you understand that you're there to advocate for your client, whoever you're representing. Okay, so invent options for mutual gain. So uh, integrative negotiation requires us to brainstorm, to think outside the box, right? To look at solutions that we can put on the table that might be creative, might give others an opportunity to think about the problem from a very different um, kind of point of view. 
I think of myself, so as a mediator, what I always do is I think of myself uh, when I think of, um, there's a, a great film that I love called My Big Fat Greek Wedding. And in My Big Fat Greek Wedding, if you've seen it, the daughter really wants to go to university and, and the mom goes up to talk to the dad and the dad's like, no, it's not happening. And so the, the mom comes out and she's talking to the daughter, uh, Tula, and she's talking to the daughter. And so the daughter's upset and she says, you know, dad is the head of the household. Dad is, you know, he's going to decide and he's deciding I can't go. And the mom says, the father might be the head, but the mother is the neck. And the mother gets to direct the head, you know, however, because the neck, right? It turns the head in different directions. And that's what I think about when I think about um, being a mediator and when I think about being um, an integrative uh, negotiator, right, is coming in and helping people see that there are other options. Because usually people come into a negotiation and they see just one path forward, right? This is what I want. This is what I've decided I want. So part of your role in being a good negotiator is to help people see there might be other options and to, to turn their heads to different paths and set out other options so that they can think about the negotiation in a, a different way. Okay, so use, uh, use of objective criteria to set standards, right? So it's not about coming in and kind of saying, this is what I believe, this is what I want. It's about kind of saying, look, this is what others have done, bringing in that objective criteria. This is what we've seen before. This is what's happened in, in other situations like this. This is what we've expected and come to understand. So using objective criteria enables you to put forth, because when you propose something, what you have to be able to do is give your reason why, why you're proposing that. And so you have to be able to use those objective criteria. Okay, so let's look at going below the line. So what do I mean by going below the line? Well, good negotiators find it preferable to seek opportunities for interest-based approaches, right? So we've talked about this a little bit already. And by identifying underlying interests for both parties, we may be able to consider options and come up with satisfiers, right? So when we go beneath the surface, and I'm going to diagram it here for you in a second, right? So when we go beneath the surface, what we can do is figure out what else is going on here. Asking the right questions will obtain the information. If we have the information, information is key, key, key in any negotiation, right? So having enough information enables you to kind of create solutions or better understand what's going on, okay? So determine the underlying interests and the drivers of the position, right? So why is the person at the table? What do they truly want? What's the reason behind? For some people, I've seen this time and time again, they come into a negotiation and the driver is that they're angry, they've been offended, they've been hurt, they've been harmed. They feel frustrated with whatever the situation is, okay? So we need to figure that out, figure out what's driving this and how we can address that rather than just focusing solely on the things, on the positions at the table. So confronted with the stated position, ask for the reasons behind the positions uh, to seek information. So when somebody comes in and sits down and says to you, this is what I want, or halfway through a negotiation, we want this, why? Okay. Don't be afraid of the short, simple questions, why? It's one of the things that I think help a good negotiator is to be able to ask the right question at the right time. And then the key follow-up to the question is silence. Ask your question, stop. Let the other person answer. Too often we don't like silence. So what we wanna do, and I've seen this time and time again, is we ask a question and then we build it into three other questions. Can you tell me why? Why do you want to do this? Because I've been thinking about, and we, we give our own reasons, our own explanations, our own understanding of what's going on here. We set it all out. Really what we need to do is we need to ask the question, stop, try it. It's actually a great technique to use in any kind of a situation with somebody who's talking to you is ask a question, just stop and listen and wait for them to respond. All right, so going below the line, going below the surface. So here's our legal dispute. So if we think about an iceberg, right? Uh, I just watched Titanic, right, the other night with my, my kids. We put it on. And, you know, the, the interesting thing with an iceberg, if you look at it, right, is we see this piece above the surface. But where is, where is the, the iceberg? Well, most of the iceberg is below the surface, below the line, right? It's below the water. And that's where the real danger is. So as you can see, when you know, the Titanic hit the iceberg, as you can tell here, it's everything below the surface that's a danger, not what you can see above uh, the water. 
right? So this is uh, what we see above the waters are legal dispute. Sorry for my ridiculously grainy picture. But this is what brings us to the table, right? This is the conflict. This is the thing that brings us together, right? This is, so this is the issue at hand. And what we need to do is not focus on this because this isn't where everything is, is uh, above the surface. We need to step back go below the surface and look at those underlying interests, the needs, the values, and the drivers. So in any dispute, in any conflict, there are going to be uh, opportunities to go beneath the surface to truly figure out what's going on and to really examine the relationships and what's uh, happening here. So what I want you to think about when you're thinking about approaching a dispute is you have to think about um, what are the emotions involved? Okay, so are people angry? Well, usually if they're in some kind of a legal dispute, if they're in some kind of uh, uh, contentious situation, then uh, if they're in a conflict, there are strong emotions involved, right? So why, where do those emotions come from? What occurred, what brought those emotions to the surface that they ended up with this dispute, right? Because sometimes what you'll find is people have worked together for a long period of time, they've been in business for a long period of time. In, in my practice, people have been married for a long period of time. And so what's going on is that there are certain things now that have brought things to the surface and resulted in this uh, legal dispute. So we're going to go below and figure out what's driving this. So why are we here at this table today? What specifically is happening? What's going on? What are the needs and what are the values that have brought us to the table? with this legal dispute. Okay, so um, I just wanna focus again a little bit more on this because I want you to really think about and understand everything that's going on here, right? So oftentimes when we get into negotiation, we spend all of our time focused on the part of the iceberg that we see above the water. So this is the traditional model, is this is, this is why you're here, this is we're gonna divide this. Whereas, as you can see in the picture, there's so much happening below the line, below the surface. And if you take time, if you're willing to ask questions, if you're willing to go beneath the surface, you can really figure a lot of things out. So let's take a typical lawsuit. And, and you know, one of my favorites that I mediated involved a $20 million lawsuit. And when we came into the room, I had a couple of attorneys on one side, a couple of attorneys with a client on the other side, this, uh, you know, client sitting at the end of the table, this gentleman, and he was very angry, very frustrated, very upset. And he was sitting there with, the, with his arms folded. And this negotiation was going on around him. The attorneys were going back and forth and they were really dismantling the legal dispute. They were there at the, the top of the iceberg. And so as they carried on talking, I looked at this gentleman at the end of the table and I, I asked him a question. I said, how are you feeling about all of this? So we, we try to avoid these feeling questions, right? How do you feel? Uh, in the legal community, um, you know, we, we're not interested sometimes in how people feel. So by asking how he felt, he then shared how angry he was. And it occurred to me that one of the drivers here was that he felt offended by the other business and how they've handled things. And he felt offended. He felt that they disrespected him. And a large chunk of the lawsuit kind of factored that in, right? So it was punitive damages. So it's something you can do here in the US, right? So he felt that they breached the contract. The way that they breached the contract had been a direct insult to him and their relationship. He had set things up in this contract to create an ongoing relationship. He wanted, they needed each other, his service and, and their facilities they needed each other and there was a great opportunity for them to make a lot of money working with each other. And so he had set things up so that it would be an ongoing, long lasting relationship. They breached part of that agreement and he felt angry about it and he felt personally harmed and offended by it. And so by talking to him about his feelings and asking him about his feelings, I was able to uncover that information. And as part of the agreement, what we were able to do was structure into an apology because that mattered to him. And it was surprising to me how much he was willing to give up financially to have that apology and to have that opportunity to put things together in a way that he felt uh, respected who he was, respected what he does, and prevented these uh, issues from coming up again. But that only came about by going beneath the surface and talking to the parties at the table.
Okay, so there's an inherent tension, so let's touch on this, between cooperating and competing. And I've touched on this a little bit already. So between creating value and claiming value. So the competitive behavior may drive out that cooperative behavior. When you sit down, that muscle memory that I've touched on, where we sit across the table from each other and we, we automatically feel it. Somebody comes in, maybe they come in a little strong, Okay. And so I always talk about separate the people from the problem. So somebody might come in, they might be a bit aggressive. They might be a bit assertive. And what we have to do is be mindful of our own, um, our own ego, right? Because when somebody comes in to the table and say, they sit down, they're like, well, this is what we're going to do, right? Our response is, well, no, we're not going to do that. Right. And we want to respond in kind. But what we have to do is think about what are we there to do? What's the goal at hand? And not be offended because in all honesty, the person sitting down across the table from us could have had a bad day. They could have had a bad morning. They could have had a bad discussion in the hallway with their client. They may have had just a bad drive or finding a parking spot getting to court, right? So there's so many reasons why somebody might not be in the best mood. So when, and you'll see this time and time again in your own personal relationships, where somebody comes up, they start talking to you. You feel that they're talking to you in a tense, aggressive, whatever manner. You respond in kind. Suddenly you're in an argument, uh, a confrontation breaks out. And when you really break it down and talk to each other at the end of the day, you find out that it was just the other person or you were having a bad day, right? So somebody might come up and say something to you. There, there's no harm meant, no tension in their voice, but you're having a stressful day. And so you take it and interpret it as an aggressive tone and in an aggressive way and you respond in kind. So uh, if everyone competes, everyone may lose. And this is the thing to think about it, right? If we're both sitting there kind of fighting, 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 there's a possibility that there will be a breakdown in the negotiation, a breakdown in communication, and it will cost everybody at the table a lot. So joint gains often are only possible through cooperative behavior, right? So through working together, um, we can, if we're positive, and, and I know I'm saying positive, but if you use positivity, optimism, things like this, um, go beneath the surface, try to figure out what's going on. It's amazing what can happen in a negotiation. Even if somebody comes in trying to be a jerk, you have the ability to change the tone, to change the environment in the negotiation by how you choose to respond. So if somebody comes in being, you know, hard, uh, aggressive, very competitive, and you respond, look, there's a possibility that, you know, uh, they might try to take advantage of you. There's every reason to believe that they will take advantage of you or try to take advantage of you. Just because you respond with kindness and talking about trying to figure out solutions that work for everybody doesn't mean that you have to give up on everything that you want in the negotiation. But in doing so, you might receive something good in return. Okay, so uh, competitors can win at the expense of cooperators, right? And so this is what I'm just talking about here is there is a possibility that if you win and you try to cooperate, that they will take advantage, that they will try to um, win, that they will try to control the situation. So just be mindful of where your lines are when you are negotiating, what you're willing to do. Okay, so conflict. Conflict can be defined as a sharp disagreement or opposition and includes the perceived divergence of interest or a belief that the party's current aspirations cannot be achieved simultaneously, right? So this is what brings us to the point of negotiation, right? More often than not is some form of conflict. So let's look at some styles of conflict management, right? So first of all, we've got our contenders, right? So actors pursue their own, uh, own outcome strongly. So little concern for the other party uh, obtaining their desired outcomes, right? So it's constantly contending uh, just out for their own end. Okay, so yielding. Actors show little interest in whether they attain their own outcomes, uh, quite interested in whether the other party attains their outcomes, right? So constantly yielding, uh, giving things over. So when I go through this with students, it's, it's kind of interesting for them because what they often do is they'll sit there and kind of think, this is the kind of negotiator I am. And when we've done some simulations, when we've done some role plays where they've had opportunities to negotiate, they reassess and they see that they might be a yielder. Some see, that them, see themselves as contenders. Okay, so um, 
in action. So actors show little interest in whether they attain their own outcomes and little concern of whether they attain the other party's uh, outcomes, right? So they, they just don't care. They're just there, okay? Some people, this is how they approach conflict. This is how they approach uh, disputes. Okay, so problem solving. Actors show a high concern for obtaining their own outcomes as well as a high concern for the other party in obtaining their outcomes, right? So this is the problem solving approach, going in, sitting down and thinking, how can we work together? How can we find a way for you to get what you want and a way for me to get what I want? All right, and then finally, uh, we have compromising and actors show moderate concern. Sorry, I have this bar here and sometimes it's in the middle of my uh, PowerPoint, All right? So I'm just moving it around, forgive me. Okay, so actors show moderate concern in obtaining their own outcomes as well as moderate concern for the other party in uh, obtaining their outcomes, right? So they, they're interested in compromising. They're not highly uh, problem solving dri driven, but they, they're more willing to just, you know, compromise uh, to some degree to, to uh, get through the conflict. Okay, so I really like this quote from Machiavelli's The Prince, right? So he who has not first laid his foundations may be able with great ability to lay them afterward, but they will be laid with trouble to the architect and danger to the building, right? So what is this? This is talking about preparation, right? So before any negotiation, before you go into any situation you need to prepare, you have to do your homework. So recently, uh, my wife and I, we went out to buy a, a car for her. And so before we did so, I sat down at the laptop and I looked at all of the options. I looked at what was available uh, at the different car dealerships at the different car lots near us, um, kind of figured out what she did and didn't want with the car even down to things like the color, right? And so my wife is one of those people that sh she didn't care it, with her previous car that she just got rid of. She walked in and she said, this is what I want. And they said, great, what color? And she was like, don't care. They pulled the car around front. She took it in the sense that to her color didn't matter, you know, price and everything else mattered, but the color just didn't matter to her. We, we got the deal we wanted, we drove it off the lot. And then I spent many years listening to how she wished she hadn't got that color of car because of X, Y, and Z, right? And so this time around, I decided to be a lot more prepared and kind of show her the colors, think through exactly what she wanted, what buttons, what whistles, what bells, what things she didn't feel she needed. Because all of these cars, you know, they're gonna sell you on all of the, the good things, like you need this and try this and take this and it adds to the price. And so we didn't want any of that. So what I did was I prepared so that when I went in, I was ready for the negotiation. I was ready, I knew exactly what we wanted, what she wanted, and I was able to kind of focus on the negotiation at hand. And so it's so important to think about this when you are negotiating, right? Because you may, get in there and kind of think to yourself, look, I'm good, I'll be good on the fly, I'll get in there, I'll come up with an agreement that'll work. But you do run into problems if you don't think things through. And you'll see this because that's where um, people rescind a deal or an offer or whatever else because they go in, they think that they've got an agreement, but when they step away from the table, it wasn't something, it wasn't within the parameters of what they could agree to. So, prepare, prepare, prepare. That will make a big difference to um, the deal that you're coming up with. And I always like to say it. So I live here in Southern California. When I moved here first, I'd never thought about earthquakes. When you live here, you realize earthquakes are a part of life. And so a good solid foundation makes a difference to the building. So in California, earthquakes uh, are part of the structure when they're thinking about building a, a building, uh, building a home, whatever it might be. And so they need to put the proper foundation in place so that the building that goes on top of that, I think about the, uh, the Salt Lake Temple and the things that they're doing there right now, uh, the changes that they're making in the foundation. You think about that foundation that it's originally been on for all of this time, right? There was so much thought and planning went into that. So that building would stand and has stand and withstood so many things. And so the same goes for um, negotiation. So think about that, preparing beforehand so that when you put that foundation in place, um, anything you do in the negotiation will work. BRT. So for those of you who served a mission a long time ago, you'll probably recognize uh, BRT. This is something that I stole from my 
uh, missionary days at the MTC in London. So build relationships of trust. Okay. So in any negotiation, you have a very small window in which you can build a relationship of trust, right? And what do I mean by that is getting in there and connecting with the other person. It's about your body language. It's about your eye contact. It's about your tone of voice. All of these things uh, contribute to the relationship between you and the other parties at the table. So no matter what the negotiation is, think about uh, what's important and how you can connect with the other person using their name, simple things like that. Like when I'm in a room, when I'm mediating, what I do is I sit down, I get everybody's names, I write their names in front of me on a piece of paper so that when I'm talking to them, I can use their names, I can pull them into the conversation. If I use your name, you're gonna to listen to me, you're gonna pay attention, you're gonna focus on what I'm saying. I use my body language, I turn to talk to the person that I'm talking to so that they feel connected to me, right? So small things like this can make a big difference in a negotiation. All right, so, once we've gotten in to the negotiation, once we're sitting down at the table and we've had that opportunity to build that relationship of trust, what we need to do is develop and expand our information base. And what I mean here is that we've done all of our foundational preparation, right? So before we walk into the room, we've prepared, we've prepared, we've prepared. We, we know what we need. We've thought it through. We've anticipated uh, our BATNA, right, our best alternative to a negotiated agreement. We've kind of thought through their BATNA, what might be their best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Um, we've th thought through all of these things. Now what we need to do is get in and sit down and get information from the other side, right? In order to be able to go below the surface, in order to be able to be an effective uh, competitive negotiator, right? So if I want to be competitive, if I want to win, what I need to be able to do is extract as much information as possible from the other side so that I can use that to my benefit. So non-directive interviewing is usually the best way to approach things first and foremost. So the interviewer begins with open questions, giving primary control of discussion to the interviewee. So here's what you need to think about is, when you sit down at the table, ask a question that invites a narrative, right? So what you want to do is ask an open-ended question that allows the person across the table from you to begin talking and kind of share. Sit back and just listen. Because the more that they share, the more information that you're going to be able to obtain. Um, I think back to one negotiation uh, mediation that I was involved in, and an attorney came in, sat down, opened up his iPad device and started typing. I think he was sending out emails. So while one side was talking, he's just sitting there typing away, just doing his own thing. And it kind of struck me and it occurred to me that he wasn't listening, he wasn't paying attention, they were sharing key and important details. He was like, I know this, I don't need to li listen to this anymore. And he, he's gonna miss out on key things. So allow them to kind of share. Sometimes what we do with, uh, in certain negotiation situations or with limited experience, we come in and we just pepper the other side with questions. Boom, 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 boom. I think the best approach always is sit, ask a question, invite a narrative, sit back, why don't you tell me what's going on? Why don't you tell me uh, why you're here? Why don't you explain to me uh, your views on this? Whatever it might be. So the interviewer does not impose his or her own uh, ideas on the interviewee and assumes that the interviewee knows what information is best and what is to be discussed, right? So you let them tell you. Now, this is actually really great when you're meeting with clients or meeting with somebody for the first time let them give you their story. And then what we do is we move to a directive uh, interviewing approach. So what do we mean here? Well, this is the interviewer then leads the discussion at his or her own pace, uh, but with clarifying and close questions. So once we've kind of taken a very general understanding uh, that narrative of what's going on, what we want to do is start formulating questions in our head. Now, what I see oftentimes uh, when people get in and somebody's talking is they wanna put their head down and start writing notes, right? I say to my students all the time, when I go hang out with friends, if I'm talking to family, whatever it might be, and they're sharing something that's important, how often do you take a pen and paper and start taking detailed notes? You don't, right? What you do is you sit there and you listen to what they have to say, and you're able to absorb that information. So what notes do I take? Well, I write down key things like, dates, uh, amounts, uh, specific information, names, 
right, that are relevant and pertinent to the negotiation and why we're there. So I don't need to take detailed notes. What I need to do is focus on the person across the table from me because I can um, obtain so much information by focusing on their body language, their tone of voice, actively listening. And we're going to talk about that in a second, right? So once I've kind of heard their narrative, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip switch, flip the switch and start asking those very direct questions. Start thinking about um, the details, the information that they've shared with me. And then once I've got that, what I'm going to do is be very specific. So you mentioned this, you brought this up. Can you tell me a little bit about more about this so that I can obtain more information and understand more about where we're going with the negotiation. So how can you improve communication in negotiation? So let's think about listening. So there are three major forms of listening to, that we're going to touch on. So passive listening. So receiving the message while providing no feedback to the sender. So that's like sit back, just listen, right? Hear what the other person has to say, take it all in, kind of um, just not responding, not agreeing, not giving them any information, just listening. Acknowledgement, right? So this is the, the nodding of the head, maintaining the eye, good eye contact. Uh, I remember one time with the student and I was talking about good eye contact and I said, look, you know, when you come in, you sit down, you start taking notes, right? So you put your head down, you're, you're not maintaining good eye contact with the person across the table from you. I need you to lift your head and engage a little bit more. So the student came in and sat down and started taking detailed notes and holding this eye contact. And I said, look, here's the thing. Don't creep out the other person, right? They'll make them feel uncomfortable at the table. What we want you to do is be natural in your eye contact, be engaged, just let them know that you're there and just acknowledge uh, what they're saying. And then of course we have that active listening. So it's the receiver's restate or uh, paraphrase uh, the sender's message. Sorry, that should say the, the message coming across. So this is where what you're going to do is you're going to listen to what they're saying and you're going to say to them, so I hear you saying this. So why do we do this? Why does this matter? Well, here's the thing. If I'm sharing a story and I say to you, uh, the car was driving really fast and then it turned the corner and um, you know it, it, it hit the, the tree or it hit whatever, right? So when I hear that, I'll say back to you. So if I understand you correctly, the car was driving really fast, it turned the corner and then it, it hit the tree or whatever. So when I restate it back to you, you're gonna realize that there are certain details that I either didn't pick up on or that you didn't share with me. So restating back allows you an opportunity to add additional details or maybe clarify something, right? So when I'm restating, what I'm going to do is look for opportunities to clarify. So for example, in this scenario, if I'm asking clarifying questions, when I'm actively listening, what I might say is, how fast was the car going, right? So as a father of four, to me, a fast car is one thing versus if you talk to a 25 year old or an 18 year old or whatever, somebody much younger, to them a fast car is something going really, really fast and uh, our perceptions of speed might be very different. So you wanna listen and restate and then ask those uh, follow up questions, right? So active listening. So what qualities does a good listener possess? So let's touch on some of these. So good listeners resist distractions and take action to remove any distractions from their communication with others. Well, what is our number one distraction today? Well, it's going to be our cell phones and our devices, right? And I say this all the time when I'm teaching people. When I went to law school, uh, you know, it was back in the day, and I didn't even have a cell phone, but I remember clearly the rule was, you know, uh, your cell phone should not be turned on because the faculty, the professors didn't want these phones ringing in class. And so since law school, my phone has always been on silent. But now if my phone is in my pocket and it starts to vibrate, right? It starts to uh, send me a signal that something's going on. Where's my mind? Well, my mind is no longer on the conversation at hand. My mind is like, who's calling me? Like what's going on here? Maybe. Maybe it's, you know, my lunch appointment, maybe it's something important, maybe. So I'm not focused, I'm not paying attention. So it's about removing those distractions from our circumstance, from our situation. Um, I used to teach as part of one of the programs that I did at the law school, we would work with incarcerated minors. So we would work with uh, juveniles at juvenile hall. We would go out and sit with these kids. And so what we would do is we'd go in and we'd sit there and line up about four or six of them up and talk to them and teach them about conflict and dispute resolution skills. 
and we would sit across from them, myself and a, a law student in groups. And what I came to realize is that where you set those chairs up made all the difference because if I had my back to the TV, more often than not, there's some movie going on, some film going on in the background. So if all the uh, participants are sitting facing the screen, their gaze is going to naturally fall onto the screen. They're not gonna be focused on me and what I'm talking about. So what we learned to do is to flip the, the situation so that their backs were to the screen and the screen was in my eyesight so that I could focus on them, talk to them. So removing certain distractions from conversation. If, you've, uh, if you're in a relationship with somebody, if, you, if you're married, you'll understand this, right? If the TV's on and your spouse is trying to have an important conversation with you or your phone's in your hand, or if you have teens, you understand this, right? Those distractions can be uh, a hindrance to a good conversation. So good listeners put aside their own views and opinions for the time being, right? So we're not there, as we're listening, as we're taking in information, we're not there to tell other people what we think, tell other people what should happen. We're there to just listen and not engage, right? So good listeners focus on a person's feelings, thoughts, and behavior. And when I shared my example from the mediation that I did, and I asked this individual about his feelings in the negotiation, in the mediation, that made a big difference. So as uh, somebody involved in a negotiation, I want you to think about the other person's feelings, thoughts, and behaviors, all right? And so good listeners pay attention to both those verbal and nonverbal cues, right? So we've heard this time and time and time again, right? So pay attention, be a good listener. I don't know how many times then I've done a situation with people, uh, done a role play, whatever it might be. And when I uh, ask them about certain things or ask them certain questions, they actually were not paying attention and not being good listeners. Sorry. So these are just a couple of traits, just a couple of things to think about when you are trying to engage with somebody and trying to listen to them. A um, couple of things to avoid, okay? so. Poor communication. So negotiation tactics, uh, tactics vary widely. So um, the results uh, that results in misunderstanding, anger, defensive, or retaliatory moves. So here's what I want you to think about: is that the way we negotiate, the way we communicate, can be very different. Um, when I moved to the U.S. first, the way in which people communicated with me or talked to me about certain things. It was very different culturally for me. And so we have to think about this, right? Because there are so many elements that go into a negotiation. So somebody's background, how they talk, how they communicate, um, it can lead to, right? So the outcome can be uh, escalating competitiveness, right? So think about how you come across in a, a negotiation, how you wanna be perceived, um, and what you can do to either help that process along, or if somebody in the negotiation is communicating poorly think about what you can do to help them because you don't want to necessarily end up in a situation where you're fighting over something so let's talk about some persuasive techniques all right we're gonna wrap up here in a second um, so in order to be persuasive in the negotiation you must establish credibility so often we judge the message by the source and I touched on this earlier your reputation matters. It makes a big difference, right? But also what you bring to the table. So I know some people come into a negotiation and they want to be like, look at me. I've done all of these amazing things. Yay, you should respect me, right? So don't assume that by kind of throwing out your experience, your education, whatever it might be, that that's going to uh, establish credibility for you, okay? Um, it's gonna be things like your reputation or how you hold yourself in the negotiation, how you communicate about things. If you've done the preparation, right? If you followed Machiavelli's statement and you've laid a good foundation, you're gonna be able to go in there, be credible. You're gonna be able to effectively share things with the other side. Um, I often think about credibility when you think about politics, right? So if you think about the somebody talking about politics who has a very different political viewpoint to you, you don't, you don't believe anything they've got to say, right? Because there's no credibility there and you ju you're judging the source of the information. Okay, so feelings, right? So appeal to the positive, optimism, humor, flattery. I love using humor, I love being optimistic. Um, you know, so address those feelings, right? And, and then discuss the negative, any fear or guilt or anger or anything like that. Don't shy away from them. Okay, so reciprocity. And I touched on this already, right? So 
blah, blah, if I could speak English, reciprocity is a fundamental expectation in negotiation, right? So what we do is we anticipate that the, there's gonna be some give and take, there's gonna be some back and forth in the negotiation. And just remember to be consistent and committed to your approach, right? So effectively exploit a consistent uh, approach or position. So anchoring, so we're gonna finish up here. So anchoring is making the opening offer, right? And it anchors the negotiation. So there's a lot of debate, who should open the negotiation, right? So anchoring is a cognitive bias that describes the common human tendency to reply to, to rely too heavily on the first piece of information that's offered, right? So what you have to do is think about who's opening, how they're opening the negotiation, what the opening offer is going to be. Should you make the first offer in a negotiation? Well, I mean, here's the thing. For me, what I want to do is I want to get in, sit down. I want to ask all of those good questions. I want to find out as much information as possible. Anchoring the negotiation kind of sets the dance floor. So, you know, setting that anchor might enable you to bring the negotiation result closer to where you want it to be rather than allowing the other person. Oftentimes you want to go in and you really want to figure out where they're coming from. So you might want to allow them to anchor in the negotiation. So, uh, as I said there, traditionally you never show your cards. Um, please feel free if you have any questions, just email me. There I am again, david at cafamilymediation.com. Uh, I'm happy to share some materials with you. Grateful for the opportunity. I hope I haven't rushed this too much. As you can tell, I'm at home. Uh, as a lot of us are right now, and I'm doing this presentation. But I'm really excited for the uh, J. Rubin Clark Law Society's virtual programs in that we can share messages and get them out to so many practitioners and so many members around the world. And I hope that you've enjoyed my presentation tonight, and I hope, or this evening, and I hope you've had a good day. Bye.